I was almost 50 years old. My relationship wasn't working. And it wasn't, and I, nothing I could do could get it to work, it seemed to me. I tried everything, and I couldn't get that relationship with a significant other to work. And it wasn't the first time that my relationship with a significant other wasn't working. Nor was it the second. <laughs> Nor was it the third. <laughs> and, uh, nor the fourth, nor the fifth, and so, <laughs> and so I found myself asking in the middle of the night, what does it take to make relationship work? What's the secret? Somebody tell me, because I swear, I'll do it if you'll just tell me. And I found myself sitting on the couch in the dark at 4.15 in the morning, stewing in my own juice, as it were. Just sitting there glumly, not knowing where to go with all this frustration. It's the middle of the night. I can't go out and break up the dishes or bang the walls or try to be quiet after all and be considerate. And there in front of me on the coffee table was a yellow legal pad. So I turned on a lamp and I found a pen someplace and I began to write. To write out my anger. What does it take to make life work? What have I done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? Somebody tell me the rules of this game because I promise I'll play, just tell me the rules. And I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote those and many other angry questions in a letter to no one in particular. I didn't know what I was doing there. I was just, you know, just getting it out. It was kind of like self-therapy or whatever. And after 20 minutes of that kind of writing, I put the pen down or tried to, but the pen wouldn't leave my hand and I found myself bringing it back to the yellow legal pad at the same time that my mind was filled with a thought, a thought that was brought to my mind with such volume, it was so loud inside my head that I couldn't possibly ignore it and I realized that I wasn't supposed to and so I wrote it down and the thought was, Neil, do you really want answers to all of these questions or are you just venting here? <laughs> and I wrote back. I wrote back to myself, I said, I, I am venting, I am, but if you've got questions, I'd sure as hell like to know what they are. And the answer's two, please. And so I continued in what turned out to be an extraordinary dialogue. But it was exactly as if I were taking dictation from a voiceless voice that existed only inside my head that went on for three and a half hours at 7.30 or quarter to eight in the morning I looked back, turned the pages back to see what I had written, what had been produced. And it was the most astonishing stuff. I sat there and read it, really read it, because for the first time, because until then I was just taking it down so fast, I wasn't paying a whole heck of a lot of attention to the details of it. But as I read it over, I started to cry. And I realized that I had been struck at some deep part of me by the beauty and the simplicity of the wisdom on that pad of paper. And the next night, the same thing happened. And likewise, the night after that, and the night after that, and for the next three weeks in that way. And for the next year, in fact, but not every night. The result is what many of you have already read and many of you have heard about, a book called Conversations with God, which was never intended to be a book. The book that you read, those of you who read it, is exactly what came off the yellow legal pad. There's not one word changed, not one paragraph deleted or added. What you see is exactly what I wrote over that period of time of one year, handwritten manuscript, which was then simply typeset and put into book form. Hampton Rhodes thought at first that they would do some normal editing like all publishers edit books, but they, you know what, they couldn't find anyone who wanted to edit God. <laughs> and so the book hit the, hit the stands exactly as it hit the yellow legal pad. There's not a dot changed or a T left uncrossed, it was exactly the way it, it was written. And uh, there's a certain beauty to that. There's a certain purity to that. So what you're reading is exactly what came through, including my astonishment when I was told in the dialogue, by the way, there'll be two other books. And I, I said, what? I said, yes. And the second and third books 
uh, will deal with even larger issues than this first one, because there are some changes being made on this planet, and this book is part of a wave of changes and a wave of new understandings, that a new paradigm is being constructed. Maybe even if I could dare use the phrase, a new social order, what are you doing here? What are you up to? What are you doing? And why? That's a question that I asked myself a number of years ago. And it is a question which led to this extraordinary dialogue that occurred in my life. I asked myself that question, what am I doing here? And I asked myself another, a question that my father had asked me from the time I was nine years old. Who the hell do you think you are, anyway? <laughs> I heard that question from my father. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. Who do you think you are? I spent the rest of my life trying to find the answer. <laughs> and it's an important question. In fact, it is the central question I have come to understand in all of life. Indeed, who do you think you are? Because, of course, you are who you think you are. Now, when I was 18, I thought I was my hair. <laughs> I did. But when I turned 20, I realized how silly it was for me to hold that thought. It was an immature, childish, almost adolescent thought, surprisingly adolescent for an 18-year-old. And at the age of 20, I came to clarity about who I am. Of course, I wasn't my hair. <laughs> it was my car. <laughs> but when I turned 21, it dawned on me, gosh, what a crazy, silly thought that I've engaged in, that I've entertained. I am my car. Well, how silly, of course. I'm not my car. I'm my women. <laughs> and I knew that I was my women, because everywhere I went, I could feel the sense of judgment about me. I could feel people beginning to make decisions about who I was based on who was on my arm or who wasn't. So I knew that I was my women, and I want to tell you that I played that game called I Am My Women for a very long time. <laughs> it was a delicious game to play. But somewhere around 35, 38, somewhere in that fuzzy 35 to 40 area, I, I realized at long last that I can't be my women, because I have been through so many of them, you see. <laughs> so I thought, well, that can't be who I am. I got it, I know who I am. And my father, who was delighted with my decision and my choice at that time, because he said, huh, the kid's finally grown up, because I had decided at the age of 39, all together, guys, I am my job. How come more women knew that than men here? <laughs> See, guys, we don't want to admit it, but the, all the women in the audience are very clear who we think we are. But finally, I realized I can't be my job because I had nearly as many jobs as I had women. <laughs> I was changing careers every 18 months. And, and, and so I thought, gosh, if I'm my job, I'm really a mixed up person, which of course was true. But nevertheless, I finally got, as I entered my middle 40s, you know what? I'm not my job because I've changed jobs and changed whole career fields. And I'm still here. Well, then who am I? And then I made a decision with which my wife finally agreed. Oh, of course, I'm my family. I am my family. And I knew I was my family. Because wherever I went, the first thing I would do is take out my little wallet. You know, want to see some pictures of my kids? And then I came home one day and found that the house was empty. Not just of people, but of furniture. <laughs> And I thought, this is strange. <laughs> so I, I looked around, and there was no furniture in the house. True story, it happened. And I thought, oh, we've been robbed. <laughs> but then I, I realized, no, 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 wait a minute. Th there, there are still some things here. There's an old chair there in the corner. 
and a bookcase over there that I've had for quite a while, and there's my old hi-fi set over there that I brought into the marriage, and an old lamp over there that I brought that I that I brought into the. And I remember the day very well. I cried, as who wouldn't? I cried the cry of a deserted man. What have I done? How horrible have I been that my wife, my beloved, would take herself and our children away, steal away in the middle of the day, and not even say goodbye? Who is this person that she is so afraid of and so, so wanting to get away from? I don't know who that person is, and I cried out to God, who is this horrible person that they walk away from without even saying goodbye? That can't be me, because I still like me. So who is that? God, who am I? And what am I doing here? Well, it's the question I bring you tonight. And I hope that you can come to your answers a little more efficiently than I came to mine. What we are invited to engage in, in this newer world we would seek to create, is a process called transparency. And that if we conducted all of our affairs, our individual relationships, our economic affairs, corporation with corporation, our international political affairs, all of our affairs from a place of utter, complete, absolute transparency, most of the world's problems would solve themselves in the process of life itself. And so book two lays out a schematic by which we could overlay the conceptualization called transparency upon the conduct of human affairs and that it dares us to do that. What is suggested in book two is a system of utter and absolute transparency in the conduct of all of our affairs. And the question before the human race is, are we capable of it? Can we trust ourselves enough? And in book three, wherein which is described in detail some of the more highly evolved societies in the universe, it is explained that for a person or a being not to be utterly and completely transparent at all times is the highest disgrace. When it becomes the highest disgrace among the beings on this planet, this planet will transform itself. God said to me, you may not know who you are, but I can tell you who you are not. You are not your body. And part of your problem is that you think that you are. And because you have thought for so long that you are your body, you have made the largest number of your choices and decisions from that place. I am my body. And so the choices and decisions that you have made have been made based on what you think your body needs in order to be happy in order to be secure, in order to be safe. And yet, said the dialogue to me, your life has nothing to do with your body. And it never did. It's a question of putting the cart before the horse. When we think that our life is about what our body is doing, then we start over here with a thing called doingness. And we think that if I gather the right kinds of doingnesses in my life, you know, and I get my body to do all the right stuff, <laughs> then when I get over here, I'll be a certain thing. I'll be happy. I'll be secure. I'll be loved. I'll be all those things that I seek to be. But what my conversation told me was this. No, 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 no. You've got it backwards. Your life is not about what your body is doing. But what your body is doing is a reflection of what your life is about. 
And so now we transform the paradigm here. We turn it around. See, we've got doing this over here and being this over here, the way most of us have lived our lives. And what I did and what I was encouraged to do was just turn it over, you know? <laughs> now I have being this over here and doing this over there. That is to say, my doing this now becomes an outgrowth of my beingness. My doing this, that which my body is doing, is a reflection of and is born of what I am being rather than an attempt to get to a place of being. You follow? The great misunderstanding about God and the great illusion about God is that God somehow cares what it is you do. And because of that misunderstanding, we all walk around in absolute trepidation that if we don't do what God wants us to do, we're somehow going to get it in the neck. We talked about this earlier. But of course, once we're clear that God doesn't give a damn what you do, I mean, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, God doesn't give a damn. God gives many blessings, but God will never give a damn. The single most important message in the book, as I experience it, is God's announcement to us, it's okay to love me again. I am not a judgmental God. I am not a punitive God. I am not a jealous nor an angry God. I am the God that you had wished that I would be. I am a God of a love which is without condition and without limitation of any kind. I am your God, and I, I am your most beloved loved one. I have created you, and I will never disown you, never, ever, ever disown you. We are afraid of each other, and we're afraid to love each other full out and without condition, person and person, and nation and nation, because we're afraid to full out love God. We're afraid to present ourselves to God in all of our humanness, how therefore could we possibly do it with another if we can't even trust God to accept us just exactly as it came down? If we can't even trust the highest being in the universe, how can we trust anyone lesser? And so I tell you that love of each other, which is unconditional and unlimited, will only be achieved when we step away from our fear of God. The second great wisdom in conversations with God could be summarized in one short sentence that we've all heard so many times before. It's beginning to sound more than trite, almost embarrassingly simplistic. I will share it with you anyway. We are all one. In my conversation with God when I was having it, Someone asked me from a newspaper about a month ago, what did it feel like? Can you describe not what you wrote or what you heard or what was said, but the actual feeling that your body experienced when this voice would come to you? And I thought about that because that was the first reporter who had asked me that question in over a year and a half of interviews. So I had to think about that and I went back into my memory of the experience and I began to tear up in this interview and I said, I remember now that it felt like there was no separation between me or anyone. That's the truth of it. That's what our soul knows must at some level be so. And that is the truth we are afraid to embrace and to actualize in our lives, except perhaps with a tiny, tiny handful of people, if that. And yet, it is the grandest truth that what I do for you, I do for me. That what I fail to do for you, I fail to do for me. That what is good for you is good for me, and what is not good for you is not good for me. Such a simple piece of wisdom. Yet if the human race would embrace it, and I want to say functionalize it, 
not just embrace it conceptually as in, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea and it's probably true, but functionalize it, that is to say, act as if that were what's really so, the sociological, political, and economic changes that would take place on this planet overnight would be such as to change our experience forever and create the paradise that we all say we have sought from the beginning of time and of which we know we are capable of creating if we will only embrace this simple truth, which, by the way, has been taught to us by all the great teachers of all the great religions and all the mystics from the beginning of time. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And when I was cold and without clothing, you gave me something to wear. And when I shivered and I found myself without shelter, you gave me shelter. When, when was that that I did that? I don't remember you coming to me thirsty and giving you something to drink. I don't remember when you were without clothing and I gave you something, much less that I gave you a place to stay. When did I, when did I do that? I tell you this. Even as ye have done these for the least of my brethren, ye have done them for me. How can we allow 400 people a day on this planet to die, die of starvation? How is it we don't storm the gates of every seat of government in this country and beyond with our letters, our phone calls, our telegrams, until they get it and see the obscenity? And I use only one simple example. There are hundreds of ways in which we do not live, you and I are one. But one of the reasons that we don't, and it's a race thing, by the way, it's not an individual thing. This is what's so hard for people to get. Individually, most of us try at least to live that to the best of our ability. We truly do, and by the way, I might add, not to be overly patriotic, but especially that's so in this country where we have the highest rate of charitable giving of most civilized nations in the world. And most of us do that. But somehow there's a collective consciousness that can't get over the hump, that can't say, yeah, let's, let's all of us do it at the same time, in the same way. Then there will be no more starving people. But the reason it stops us from collectively going to the place that we all individually sneak out into and then pull back from is because of the fear we have. And the fear is founded in a root thought that rests in the third great wisdom in conversations with God. That third wisdom is contained in even fewer words, not four, but two. There's enough. There's enough. I choose to create a world. The largest announcement from which is this. There's enough. There is enough food. There is enough clothing. There is enough shelter or opportunity to provide enough. There is enough money until we get. There is enough. We are all one and love is all there is until we get the three basic wisdoms. We'll forever congregate in rooms like this. We'll forever pick up books like Conversations with God. We'll forever continue on our endless search for the answers which have been given to us already and which we have held in the palm of our hand from the beginning of time. The question, therefore, is not what is the answer. The question is what inside of us stops us from embracing the answer which is as clear as the nose on our face and has been given to us over and over again by every spiritual teacher on the face of the earth. And so, yes, we will return, only to leave again, only to return, only to leave again, to continue on and on as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be, ever shall be, world without end. I could, of course, be wrong about all of this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
the difficulty within the human experience is truly understanding what is in our best interest. When we rise to a level where we understand deeply and intuitively that in fact our best interest is that person's best interest and that person's best interest and that person's best interest, then the conflict goes away. Then when we think of ourselves first and when we think of what is in our best interest first, we wind up doing what is in the best interest of others automatically. But we don't do it because we perceive that it is in their best interests. We do it because we're clear it's in our own. Do you see the difference? And it's a conceptualized difference. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shift in the place that we, as, we, as the kids say today, the place we're coming from. Rather than coming from this place called, I will do it for you because I see that you need it and it would be of help to you. We come from a new place called, I will do it with you and for you because I notice that I am doing it with and for myself. And so we shift the paradigm of our experience as we change our understanding of what is in our own best interest. However, our understanding of what is in our own best interest would never change until we got clear what we're doing here, which is where I started an hour and a half ago. <laughs> See, if you're clear and if your life, if you know that my life proceeds out of my intention for it, my life proceeds out of my intention for it. And if my intention is not to make sure that I have all the marbles, or even that my kids do, or that I have enough to leave my family, if my intention is not to make sure that I'm okay, or that I'm clothed or fed and all those things, if I'm clear that I don't have to worry about that, if I get clear that those things will happen automatically when my concerns are shifted to a different and higher level, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things will be added unto you. I promise you that is true. Everything that I sought and struggled for for so many years, worldly success, money beyond my wildest dreams, public acclaim, and even if I could immodestly suggest it, the love of others. All that for which I struggled mightily for 45 years stayed away from me until I shifted the axis of my experience and caused myself to notice that my life had nothing to do with me, that my life had everything to do with you. And you, and you and that when I decided to devote the rest of my life, all of the remaining days I had left given to me, to bringing a larger understanding and a greater level of insight to all of you than everything that I asked for and struggled for so long came crashing in on me and I couldn't have stepped aside from it if I tried. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you. My conversations with God will never end and neither will yours. My conversations with God go on and on and on, even forevermore, whether or not I'm in the process of producing a thing we call a book. And that's true of you and of all of you. And it's not a bad place for us to end this particular portion of our time together, to really deeply and intuitively understand the largest message of conversations with God. I am talking to you. I am speaking with you always, in every way there is. My life is, has been, and always will be a continuing and ongoing conversation with you. And your life, says God, will be a conversation with me. What then do you choose to tell me? What do you choose to tell me and to announce and to declare about yourself? What do you choose to tell me and to announce and declare about each other? What do you choose to tell me, to announce and declare about me? 
What do you choose to tell me about life, this grand gift I have given you? You are making it up as you go along. You are creating it each day and creating it anew. Create it well. Create it wisely. Create it wondrously. Live the grandest version of the greatest vision ever you had about who you are. Let's do it, and let's do it now. God bless you, and good night. To support you on your spiritual journey, Neil has created Recreation, a nonprofit foundation. The foundation's work focuses on spreading the message of conversations with God through lectures, seminars, and workshops. In the newsletter, Neil answers questions from readers all over the world on the materials found in the Conversations with God books. It also contains news of our foundation's activities and how you can partner with us. To receive the newsletter, please write to Recreation. The cost of the subscription is $25 per year, which covers the expenses of getting the newsletter to you. Write us, 